but uh, so we 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 kind of learn through going to these types of workshops and, and user workshops at, at NCSA and OLCF and then try to to, to use that uh, 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 new knowledge in our in our programs to improve their performance. Um, so, but but what are our major objectives when we use OpenMP? So we typically start with a pure MPI application uh, for a fluid dynamic simulation. And I'll, I'll, in the coming slides, I'll talk a little bit more about the physics. But uh, we have two different goals for the, for the type of architecture we're running on. So for for a machine like Blue Waters, a homogeneous machine, we we'll try to use OpenMP to improve the scalability of the application to very large problem sizes. So we'll have some simulations we want to run and when we scale them up, uh, the scalability of the, of the program will fall, but can we use OpenMP to try to mitigate some of the, some of the uh, impact, uh, the negative impact of scaling up. But in heterogeneous computing environments, not only do we want to achieve good scalability and efficiency at large problem sizes, but there's also this uh, problem of acceler accelerating the loops. So we have to make sure that we're effectively using the GPUs and getting high performance uh, that they offer. So to, to briefly introduce the physics, we are uh, in the field of computational fluid dynamics and we study turbulence and, and, and turbulent processes uh, and fluid motion. So turbulence is uh, very important in our everyday lives. Maybe on some of your flights here, you experience some turbulence in the airplane. Uh, but turbulence is very uh, ubiquitous in nature and engineering. Uh, we rely on it uh, for, for, a lot of, uh, for a lot of applications and we need to understand it. Uh, turbulence is very challenging uh, because turbulent flows are three-dimensional and they are they're multi-scale in nature. So we have uh, a wide range of scales in both space and time that we have to resolve in a, in a simulation or even in an, uh, in an experiment in a laboratory. And the, the result is that the computations for realistic systems are, are very large. So the computational grids used, used in some of the most cutting edge simulations to date are of the order of 8192 cube grid points, uh, which my advisor has been working on on Blue Waters. This is about half a trillion grid points. And then there are some folks in the Jap uh, uh, Japanese group who have gone up to 12K cubed. Uh, to, uh, maybe try to draw some comparison. I, I've worked with other labs in the past who, who, who do more application size uh, problems and maybe something on the order of, of 512 cube grid points might be more realistic for say an application problem that you would want to do in CFD. But when we focus on the fundamentals of turbulence, we have to have computations that are much larger than, uh, than you might see in, 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 in normal uh, situations. So, uh, but what, what are we going to focus on? So we, we, turbulence uh, is kind of a state of fluid motion and uh, there is a, a turbulent velocity field which will drive uh, mixing processes in many applications. So what we want to study, what our main focus is on is, is studying the mixing of a substance in a turbulent flow. So the idea is that if you take your coffee and you stir it up in the morning and you put some cream in it, how does the turbulent velocity field in the, co in the coffee speed up the mixing process of, of the cream. Uh, so the, this, this is our main science objective for the codes that we've been working on. And I don't want to get too much into the physics, but it, there are some important physical parameters which we must keep in mind when we run the simulations. Uh, for, for simulations of turbulence, we have very strict resolution requirements that we must adhere to. Otherwise, the, the results that we would get would not be very physical or, uh, or worth our time trying to understand. So we have very strict resolution requirements based on the physics and when you consider a substance being mixed in a turbulent flow, uh, the resolution requirements for the substance being mixed might actually be greater than the resolution requirements of the velocity field providing the mixing. So we, we focus on a regime of turbulent mixing processes where the resolution that's required for the substance is much finer than what we would need for the velocity field. And this is, this is kind of a driving factor or force behind the numerical method that we use and the implementation. So we will have in our code, and I just have two more slides. I have this slide and one more to, to kind of give the background and then we'll get into the OpenMP. But we'll have a velocity field, a turbulent velocity field governed by the Navier-Stokes equations, which we solve with a Fourier pseudo-spectral scheme. And that's pretty much all we're gonna say in the talk about the velocity field. Our focus is on, on the scalar that's being mixed. 
And to, to, to show you what governs the evolution of the scalar field, we have an equation here. So this, this is an advection diffusion equation for the passive scalar. And you can see that we need a couple of things. We need derivatives of the scalar field to form the diffusion and advection, ter advection terms in the governing equation. And we need a velocity field uh, on, the, on the fine grid used for, for the passive scalar. So how are we going to get these terms? Uh, well, we, we use what are called compact finite differences. So this is kind of like a finite difference type approach to, to numerically obtained derivatives. But uh, the, the, the word compact is, is very significant because uh, there is a coupling of the grid points that are used when you evaluate the derivatives. This, is, this contrasts kind of the explicit finite differences which you might, uh, be, more, uh, which you might be familiar with for taking derivatives. Uh, but compact finite differences are very nice because they have very good resolution properties uh, and, and they provide very high accuracy uh, for the derivatives that we need in, in, in the simulations. So our, our basic code, this is kind of like a 2D schematic of the code, but what we'll do is we'll have a velocity field that's being simulated on a relatively coarse grid because the Navier-Stokes computation is a very complicated one. But then we'll have a little bit simpler compu computation going on for the scalar field on a much finer grid. And we'll have an interpolation operation for the velocity field to go from the coarse to the fine grid. And then we'll use the compact finite differences over here to take the derivatives of the scalar. Now, how do we, uh, for, the, for the parallel implementation of this, how do we do this? Well, uh, one thing, when we, when we sat down to kind of develop this code in early 2016, we thought about, well, what, what, is the, uh, what, what are the parameter ranges that we're interested in simulating, and what are the computational requirements for the velocity and scalar computations? So it, it actually turns out that the, the scalar computation is so much more massive than what we need for the velocity field that we actually use a split communicator approach where instead of performing the entire simulation in say MPI COM world, what we'll do is we'll split the communicator into two disjoint groups and we'll have a very small group of processors computing the velocity field and then they can send the, uh, the velocity field information over to a, a much larger scalar field computation going on. So to give you kind of like a, a ballpark uh, kind of uh, uh, understanding of the sizes of these communicators for what we do, if we were running one of these simulations on Titan, uh, this scalar field computation might be using eight, 8K nodes of, of this, so uh, maybe 18K available on the machine, but this computation here might be using something like 256 nodes. So this is a very small computation that's kind of coupled to a much larger computation, and this this computation over here, this is where we focus on for OpenMP uh, improvements in, in the code. So what are we going to do for the uh, uh, development of the code in the homogeneous computing environment? So we'll cut straight to the chase. I think the previous uh, talk, it, uh, one, one of the things he spoke about was they extracted the kernel to kind of understand and improve the performance of a larger application code. So we did the same thing. So in our code, the compact finite differences, which I spoke about earlier, are the most important and expensive computation in the code. And, and that these are the routines where scalability becomes an issue because communication is required among the parallel processes to, to fill ghost layers or, or form the solution for the compact finite difference scheme. So our focus is on the scalability of the CCD scheme in the form of a, of a kernel, which we will plug in to the main code uh, when we actually want to run simulations. So the CCD scheme, like I mentioned before, is a little more complicated than explicit finite differences in that, that if you have a, a, given, a, a grid line of points, all the grid points are coupled when you want to evaluate the derivatives. So how do we use a domain decomposition approach if all the grid points in a given direction are needed? Well, so in, these, in the pseudo-spectral code, what we do for the FFTs is we would have a pencil-based transpose approach to, to, to uh, do a similar type of operation with the FFT. Like we would, we would align data on a process, take FFT in a given direction, and then transpose the entire the entire data to take the FFT in another direction. You could perform a very similar uh, strategy with the compact finite differences, but it actually turns out that there is a really uh, neat algorithm that you can use to split the linear system associated with the CCD scheme on a static three-dimensional domain decomposition. And then what we'll try to do is avoid some of the very expensive communication costs associated with transpose-based approaches. So I, I don't want to get into the details of the equations that are behind some of, uh, of the lines of this table here, but 
what I want to highlight is that in the CCD scheme, when we want to apply it in parallel, there's a natural series of communication and computation operations where the overall cost of the communication is much reduced compared to a transpose-based approach. So what we will try to do in our code is see how might we, how might we try to overlap communication and computation uh, for these operations to, to improve scalability where obviously the, the, the communication is what is affecting our, our scalability to large problem sizes. So we want to see how we can use OpenMP to maybe uh, to improve scalability of our application by overlapping communication and computation. Okay, so how did we go about doing this? Well, we tried many different approaches and, and then we kind of finally converged on something that worked best. So if we have a, an MPI code, just pure MPI code, uh, the, maybe the first thing we try is to use non-blocking communication calls. So the idea here is that we have to take derivatives in three independent coordinate directions. The operations for the three coordinate directions are independent of one another. So if I need to perform a communication call for one coordinate direction, let me post that in a non-blocking communication call for MPI and move on to computation in another coordinate direction. So try to use non-blocking MPI to perform communication in the background for, uh, for another coordinate direction while I operate on, a, on, on, on say, uh, the, the given coordinate direction that I'm interested in. So that, uh, I'll show you some data later that this just didn't work out quite as well as we had wanted and we found a very kind of depressing paper by, by Hogger in 2011 where it was a Cray user group paper and they went through and, and he, he said like this is what we tried to test is do the MPI implementations uh, actually do anything with non-blocking communication behind, behind the scenes like if you post a non-blocking communication call does anything happen before you get to the MPI wait and, and it turned out that this was very implementation specific um, and so it just kind of, like we were just kind of hesitant about pursuing a pure MPI approach. Like we didn't really know if we could trust all the implementations we would use to, to perform uh, non-blocking communication as, as well as we would like for it to. And then if we, uh, but you know, we, what we can try to do is we can try to use OpenMP in the program. So for example, on Blue Waters, instead of running with 32 MPI processes on each node, maybe we try to run with four with eight OpenMP threads per MPI process. And, and that actually helps our code uh, significantly because the communication requirements are actually tied to the number of MPI processes you have. If you split up the domain into smaller and smaller chunks, you have more and more ghost layers to fill and the communication requirements actually increase as you, as you strong scale with respect to MPI processes. So we thought, well, let's just use OpenMP threads and, and reduce the communication requirements that way. And, and that definitely helped a lot, but we have this issue where if we have to go to, uh, uh, say, an OMP master region where the master thread is performing a communication call or, or maybe just terminate the parallel region to, to do a communication call, maybe those threads are not being used to the, to the, the other threads are not being used to their fullest extent. So we thought, well, let's just try another way. Uh, I saw some papers uh, by uh, Rab, uh, Rabin Seitzner, uh, maybe, maybe he's German, uh, going back even to 2003 where a lot of the OpenMP experts are saying, well, maybe we can just try to explicitly overlap communication and computation in the code by, by splitting OpenMP threads. So if I have a handful of OpenMP threads, let's, let's just let one of them do communication or, or maybe two of them do communication while the rest perform some computation. So we wanted to pursue this approach to see if it offered improvements compared to these more basic approaches. Uh, but it's... Uh, there are some challenges associated with, with this. So if I, uh, if I have a, a team of threads and I want one to perform communication while the others will only compute, uh, there are a number of issues that you might run into. So uh, how, how will I enforce the correct sequence of operations in the CCD scheme? If I have a communication thread and I have some computation threads, some order of operations still needs to be adhered to, otherwise the results would be, would be garbage. Uh, and then, uh, in addition to that, if, if, I, if I complete an operation, say, on a communication thread and the results need to be made available to the computation threads, uh, is the memory synchronized such that, that uh, the, the results that they're using would be, would be correct? And then, uh, also, we, we kind of 
we at least when we started to think about this approach we thought well we'll probably not have a one for one ratio on the ratio of communication to computation threads like presumably we would have fewer communication threads than computation threads so how do we want to how do we want to uh, have the code be able to have many more computation threads compared to the communication, th uh, communication threads and it, we, we thought about it for a while and we, we, we kind of after studying the OpenMP standard, we saw that, that locks and nested parallelism might be, might be good ways to, to tackle some of these challenges. So I, I thought that I would just kind of dive into some pseudocode for the routine to explain what we did. So for the compact scheme, we, we want to take derivatives in three independent coordinate directions, and all those operations are independent. So what we will do is we will use box for each coordinate direction. So we'll have say a lock for the x1 coordinate direction, x2 and x3 and if a communication or a computation, thre a computation thread needs to operate on say the x1 direction before they perform that operation they need to obtain this lock okay and then they can release the lock when it's finished when they're finished with the task uh, that they have to work on now uh, but what about the what about the issue of having uh, work sharing over uh, kind of like a, a sub team of the, th of the OpenMP threads well, we thought, let's not try to spawn all the OpenMP threads that we want to use in one parallel region and then try to divide them, but instead, let's just spawn two threads, and then for the computation tasks at, that we have to do, let's spawn a nested parallel region. And what that will enable us to do is for, the, for, the, for the computation uh, threads is that then with the nested parallel region, you can use all the standard work sharing constructs that you would normally do. Like if you didn't have this nested parallel region and you just tried to have eight threads across here, those computation threads can't use like OMP do and uh, because all the threads have to encounter the construct or, or none at all. So uh, I, we, we found that with the locks we were able to control the sequence of operations and who is operating on what coordinate direction at a given time and then with nested parallel region we can, with the nested parallel region we have this really easy way to expand the number of computation threads in the code. So to kind of show you how the, the code gets set up here, we will initialize the locks. We'll always start off with two threads, okay? Communication and computation. And then we'll, the master thread, because we, we still operate in the MPI thread funneled approach. So the master thread kind of goes over here and we need to set the locks in order for the operations to be completed in the right way. So the, we will try to perform communication calls for X2 and X3 first, while the, comp, while the computation threads will, will, tr will try to set the X1 lock to perform computations for the X1 direction first. And there's a subtle point here that I wanted to mention. What we did originally was we put this lock outside the parallel region and tried to get a barrier across the whole, the whole thing to make sure the locks are initialized properly. But we took a look at some of the fine print in the OpenMP standard and, and if, if we're not, if we're not mistaken, the lock needs to be kind of set by the same implicit task. So like the, I think this implicit task is different than this implicit task. So we had to come up with a, we, we use OMP test lock and a, a little bit complicated way to make sure that all the locks are set before the routine progresses. And then once that is done, we just kind of work through all of the sequence of operations for communication and computation to do, uh, to apply the CCD scheme to get derivatives in all three coordinate directions. So what you would do is the, the, the X2 and X3 locks were already set. So communication for X2 and then release the lock. Communication for X3 and then release the lock. Meanwhile, computation is going on for the X1 coordinate direction. And then we need to be careful about the order of the lock exchange here to avoid any kind of like race conditions on the locks. But when, it's, when, when the locks are released, they kind of switch hands and the, uh, the, the threads just kind of progress down through all the operations. And then, and then at this point here, we have all the derivatives that we need for the, for the scalar field in, in all coordinate directions. So how did this help improve our scalability? So on Blue Waters, it's a very big machine. It, we run pretty big computations on Blue Waters. So we try to run with the scalar field at 8192 cube grid points. And the nodes that we, like we would try to run this on like 8K nodes of Blue Waters, uh, the, the XE6 partition of Blue Waters. So I, I just kind of uh, want to focus in here on this particular data point here. To, to show you how the scalability was improved with this approach. So the open square is the pure MPI code. So this 
is MPI with blocking communication. And then we were able to make some improvements in scalability by either using non-blocking communication or just MPI blocking communication with OpenMP threads to reduce the communication requirements, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. And it was great, but I mean, we always wanted more performance and we wanted more efficiency, but th so we tried this new approach and we can see that the star where we have dedicated communication threads to, to the communication tasks, if you will, uh, the scalability seems to be uh, significantly improved to the point where we had uh, about 60% scaling uh, for this, for this uh, pure MPI approach up to 90% scaling where we dedicate communication threads. Uh, so we, uh, like we, sometimes we, we try these approaches and then we want to come back and see, well, how was it working? Like what made it work? Uh, or just try to look to see what's going on. So we have uh, also instrumented the code with uh, some timers, MPIW time, to kind of form timeline data of, 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 of the code as it's taking these derivatives. And what we're showing here are, are timelines for the bottom row is the communication thread. So this is a communication thread. And then the top row in each block is the computation threads for a weak scaling study. So at 1,024 cubed, this is a problem where scalability is not an issue for us. But at 8192 cubed on 8K nodes, scalability is, is more of a problem. So what we do is, we're, like what we're showing here, is the, the time history, the timeline of, of the communication and computation threads where you can see that at 8K nodes in 8192 cube, the communication blocks are much wider, right? So communication is more expensive at 8K nodes. So, but how, how efficiently are we hiding that communication cost? Because that's where the improved scalability and efficiency comes from. So when you, if you see here, while the computation threads are progressing on a computation in the X1 direction, the ghost layer exchange for X2 and X3 was completely hidden. So this is kind of like, this is, this is, this is great because the, uh, the communication cost is almost being entirely hidden. Now, unfortunately in this routine, it's like a lot of the computation is front loaded in the routine and some of the communication is loaded at the back. So we might in the future try to see if we, there's another rearrangement of the order of the operations that might try to hide some of this, com this uh, communication here. You can see that there was a non, there was a significant amount of time that the computation threads are spinning, waiting to get access to this lock so they could perform a very small computation for this green coordinate direction. But overall, the scalability is greatly improved uh, with this approach. Now, just looking to the future, uh, before I move on to the next, uh, uh, the heterogeneous topic, but we, we, we did this approach and then we come back, we, we, then we worked on the heterogeneous machine and learned about tasks on the GPUs. And then we kind of learned more about explicit tasks on the CPUs. So then you kind of wonder, is there, is there another way that we can do the CPU algorithm, not with a low level lock based approach, but maybe with just explicit tasks on the CPUs. So what, we, what we're uh, currently working on, because now CCE 8.6, which we just as of a couple of weeks ago have access to on Titan, uh, fully supports the depend clause on, the, uh, on explicit tasks on the CPUs. Before they were just serialized in the program, but now they're actually kind of generated and put into the task pool and, and later worked on. So what we want to try to do is use OpenMP tasks to implement the same ideas. So what we would try to do is have still two threads, one communication and one computation thread, but now have the master thread go through and generate all the communication and computation tasks. And then the two threads can kind of work through these tasks having the order enforced based on the task dependencies, okay? So what we'll try to do, for example, is we're still gonna use MPI blocking communication, so we need to make sure that the order of the communication operations is the same. Like, I don't wanna to start to do a send receive for the X1 coordinate direction, and then have another process start an all to all for the X3 coordinate direction, and I don't think MPI would like that very much. So what we'll try to do is enforce a strict ordering of the communication tasks with, say, dependency on a, ver a dummy variable com, so the order will still be kind of uh, dictated uh, in, in the program, but there's still plenty of opportunity to overlap for the computations in the other coordinate directions. This is very similar to what we did with the lock-based approach, but I think that, that using tasks in this way might, might allow us to express the ideas in the source code w uh, in a little bit less invasive way. Uh, and then I think tasks, you, you, you all know the standard more than I do, but I think tasks uh, guarantee some memory synchronizations uh, when they're created and, and destroyed. 
So uh, we are working on this. The code seems to, to be functioning and giving correct results and we've interacted with the CCE developers to understand more about how nested parallelism is, is, is more complicated than the setting. The computation tasks will still use nested OpenMP to, to, to use more computation threads, but I, I think we're going to be uh, trying it at scale pretty soon. So now let me try uh, to talk about what we did for heterogeneous uh, acceleration of the application using OpenMP 4.x uh, with an emphasis on the .5. Um, so we had this application code and my colleague Dobble, uh, he had previous experience with GPUs and he said, hey look, this looks like an application we might actually be able to accelerate. Because in the past he tried to accelerate the the Fourier pseudospectral code but it's like communication dominated and that's very challenging. But this code has much uh, reduced communication requirements. So we thought, hey, this is a prime candidate for acceleration. So but how do you go about doing that? We're not very interested in rewriting the application in another language like CUDA. Uh, we would like to try to maintain the portability of our Fortran do loops. These do loops will be around long after I die. I mean, these Fortran do loops will be around forever. So we want to maintain Fortran source code and then just leverage OpenMP to provide the offloading and the acceleration. Uh, but it's challenging to run on Titan uh, because, I mean, the memory constraints on the GPUs are very tight. So when we run, say, if you want to run on 8K nodes on Titan, well, the CPUs have so much memory available, but the GPUs are reduced by uh, a significant factor in uh, memory. So we need to make sure that the algorithms that we develop are are, are memory conscious and, 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 and using memory as efficiently as possible. And then as, as the speaker talked about earlier today, like we have to minimize data movement between the, the host and the device. Otherwise we'll be just swamped by the, the, the cost of moving data between the, the host and device memory spaces. So the goal for this effort is to accelerate just the scalar field computation. Uh, similar to the previous section where we just focused on the CCD scheme and its scalability, like we're not going to mess with the velocity field calculation at all. We're just going to be working on the scalar field computation because that is the that dominates the computation cost of our of our simulations, and we're going to try to minimize data movement by putting the entire scalar field computation on the GPU, and this required some reworking of the code. And then we want to see if we can improve scalability of the application once it's accelerated by using OpenMP 4.0. And maybe this first line goes without saying, but this is uh, definitely my first experience with accelerating an application. Uh, it was, it's challenging, you have a lot to learn, but uh, you just keep learning new things and trying new things and, and, and something sometimes it eventually works. But uh, we want to see really if we're going to run simulations on Titan, if we're going to run production simulations on Titan, you know, the, the main question we want to ask is, are we doing that efficiently? Are we using an acceptable number of nodes and, and getting good scalability to justify what we're doing? Um, so that we want to, you know, pay attention to that. Uh, and then you know, another thing is, you know, for, for the expensive computational kernels in our code, like how well are they getting accelerated? Are they getting accelerated well enough? Uh, for our particular code, the CPU version of the code was using too much memory, so we had to do an extensive kind of refactoring of the code to reduce memory for the GPUs, and, and we call them low storage algorithms. It's, it's kind of like, uh, I mean, I think mathematicians actually develop like low storage algorithms for say Runga Kata time integration. This is just like a low storage computer implementation of our code. So we will try to reuse arrays when, when we can. Um, uh, to, uh, so that this will allow us to reduce the number of GPUs that, w that we're running on. Um, some other things that, I, that I'll talk about later and I'll, I'll mention again is that the code uh, uses MPI derived data types for communication. Uh, so we have stranded memory accesses for the MPI communication calls, but when we move data between the host and the device, OpenMP standard says that this data has to be a contiguous buffer. So we actually had to, we actually had to change the source code uh, to, 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 uh, to get it to work. So let me see uh, what I can do with my remaining time. So one thing that we uh, found later, I mean, this is not the first thing that we did. This is not the first accelerated version of the code that we developed. But now that we know what we know, maybe we would have done it this way to begin with. So 
what we're doing is we're starting with a kind of a ground up approach. We're looking at the most expensive kernels in the code, which ones are not getting accelerated well, and then trying to decide up front if any algorithmic changes are required in order to get the, the, these kernels to accelerate well and, and, and then understand what implications that has for the rest of the code design. So a good case study for us was the application of the CCD scheme and the coordinate direction that corresponds to the innermost memory index of the three-dimensional arrays in our code. So what happens when we apply the CCD scheme is we have a linear system that we solve which has a forward and reverse sweeping uh, process to it. But, so th there's a conflict. We want to access memory on the GPUs in as contiguous as a manner as possible to get coalesced memory accesses on the GPUs, but this inner loop can't be vectorized. So this, this kernel right here presents a big problem for running on the GPUs. And we kind of thought about different ways to, 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 to improve this and then maybe the simplest possible way is just flip the memory layout. So for this one kernel, what we want to try to do is see if we can redesign certain aspects of the code where for this kernel, we would have the ability to stride over the arrays on the innermost index, have coalesced memory accesses, accesses on the GPU, and, and, and also be able to vectorize or, or you know, thread this operation over the GPU threads. So, this is, a, this is an example of a kernel where it kind of places memory constraints on the code because if we want to get good performance out of this kernel, we need this extra memory to kind of swap things around. Um, and what we've also tried to do is, is isolate the damage uh, to this, just this subroutine in, in the source code. So we don't want a changed memory layout to persist throughout the entire code because we have a lot of other loops which might be negatively impacted uh, by switching the memory layout of some of the working arrays. So what, we, what we've done at, in order to, to improve that kernel is swap the memory layout, which will give the best performance for the kernel of interest, and then for the immediate adjacent kernels, try to work with those to, to actually swap in and out of the, of the changed memory layout while retaining high performance. And what we found works quite well is when we, want to, when we want to perform some of the memory swapping for some of these important kernels, we just manually introduce the blocking factors and then tune them until they gave the best performance. And it turned out that the best performance offered by such an approach was very comparable to uh, the, the performance of other kernels which did not have any of these memory issues associated with them. Uh, just to also kind of show, like, it's, it's sometimes uh, if, if we're going to try to port to different machines, we need to be aware of what constructs the compilers seem to like. Uh, with Cray, uh, we, you might notice we don't have like a parallel for like a do or a SMD here. So Cray seems to like just OMP target teams distribute. And then as long as that inner loop can be vectorized, it seems like they partition it over the GPU threads. This is something that we've noticed since day one with Cray. Um, we have found that, say, for this particular type of loop, Collapse 5 might produce the fastest overall result. Uh, we're currently working on porting some of the codes with I to IBM XLS, and there we need to, say, have like a parallel do or, or, or maybe even a SIMD to, to partition it over the threads. But anyway, so to quickly show you some of the uh, performance benefits of, of, of this approach, we have conducted some small test problems for a weak scaled version of our problem. So this is something on Titan which would run on two nodes, but the computations are representative of what we run on 8K nodes. So the, we, we weak scaled the problem down, and what we're looking at are the performance of these loops. How does that loop behave when the memory layout is poor or when we try to swap it to improve the performance? And in the interest of time, I'll just draw your attention to this linear system uh, line where we have that linear system we were solving where we were accessing the memory in a coalesced way, but the, the, but the inner loop couldn't be threaded or partitioned, if you will. So uh, that doesn't seem to be very well suited for the GPU. And in fact, we, the timing compared to the other loops is, 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 is pretty uh, you know, concerning. Um, other three-dimensional, uh, like other three-dimensional nested loops, seem to run on the order of, let's say, uh, 10 milliseconds. But here we had a kernel which, after we accelerated it, was running at say 0.22 seconds. And 
this, this will uh, dominate the cost of the code because the speed up is not very good. But what we've done is when we swap the memory layout, not only does that improve the CPU version of the code, uh, because it, I think the CPU will like that as well, but the, the, but the cost is, is reduced by maybe a factor of, of six or so for, the, for, the, for this particular kernel. And we've been able to control the damage of, in those neighboring kernels with the loop blocking approach to achieve an overall uh, uh, very high speed up uh, compared to CPU execution with uh, CCE 8.6. So what we've done is we've identified these problematic kernels and we've, we've identified what changes to the algorithm are necessary in order to achieve high performance and then we have to understand like, what is the implication for the rest of the code. Well for us, I don't want to walk through all these details because time is running out, but uh, essentially what it meant for us was that we could not calculate all derivatives together. So in the CPU version of the code, we were calculating all derivatives together and trying to overlap communication with the computation for three independent coordinate directions. But now we have enough memory on the GPU where we will calculate derivatives in X1, and, and then we can, we can calculate X2 and X3 derivatives together. Um, but overall, the, the performance is, is much uh, improved with this approach. Uh, now, how are we using the, the OpenMP 4.5? In, in this in this GPU code, well, uh, to, we will still have some sections of the code where we are overlapping communication with computation. For example, like I said, the X2 and X3 derivatives can be computed together. There is enough memory to do that. So let's just get to a point in the code where we say we want to make a communication call in the X3 coordinate direction. So like here, I have an all to all where I want to make this call in the X3 coordinate direction. The way that we overlap computation uh, with this communication call is right before it, we just launch all of the X2 kernels that we have that can run on the GPU at that time. So we will just have multiple kernels. I'm just showing one here with like say OMP target teams distribute depend and out on a, on a variable that is specific to the X2 coordinate direction. Put the no wait clause there and, and you, you'll stack up a, a handful of these kernels that will be running on the GPU while this communication call is, is taking place. And the idea is to just try to make the algorithm asynchronous and overlap communication with computation uh, wherever possible. And so on, on Titan, we, we, get an about, we get about a 5x speed up for this code, for this CFD code, compared to CPU only execution. And uh, what I'm showing here in this, in this strong and weak scaling plot are the, uh, like the serialized timings, like so the, the CPU and the GPU do not act, interact asynchronously for the red pluses. And then for the blue Xs, we have allowed for some overlap with OpenMP 4.5 uh, tasking capabilities. And, uh, you know, we can always try to improve it more, but it, I mean, we are improving scalability by a pretty good uh, margin, I would say, 75% weak scaling for this problem up to about 90% is very nice. And uh, while we are including strong scaling data sets, I would just emphasize that the, the, the code runs so fast on Titan that we're running our production problems at this minimum node configuration that we can. This is the minimum amount, this, we could not run on fewer nodes because there's not enough memory on the GPUs. So we run at this minimum node configuration and this is what we're happy with. But we understand that for a scaling plot, we also need to strong scale just a little bit. So it seems like OpenMP 4.5 is helping us a lot. Uh, just to, to, before I conclude, I would like to just mention a couple of things. Uh, uh, Oscar mentioned to me that it, this would be a great opportunity to provide feedback and let us know, let you, let you know what, what we needed or what worked and what didn't work. So I mentioned this earlier, but uh, our code uses MPI communication calls with MPI derived types. So uh, the memory accesses are, are strided and we let MPI take care of that for us. Um, but we'll, what we will need to do is we will need to update the buffers on, on the host uh, from the device and, and if this inner dimension is, is greater than two, then this is a strided memory, this is a non-contiguous data transfer that we need to bring from, from the device to the host for the communication call. But the OpenMP standard, uh, I believe, says that the, the target data movements need to be contiguous. So what we do now is, I mean, we're, we're fine. I mean, like, don't get me wrong. Like, we love OpenMP 4.5 and we're using it uh, uh, very much. But what we do right now is we pack this. So we pack this into a buffer and then we update and then we perform the communication call. Then we update again and then we unpack the buffer. So 
it would be easy for the compiler to support something that will probably not be as efficient as what you're actually doing by hand. Okay. You break it down into individual copies. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, it, you know, I mean, we could, so, so the updates are continuous, the maps that are hard to do. So we map the entire array. So it's a 3D array that we've mapped all of it to the device. And so, so, so this is easy for us to support. Yeah, we, I mean, we would appreciate it because... Uh, but, but then if you look at a quality implementation issue, you may still get better performance. Okay. I see. If you're hand packed. Yeah. If, if you're just doing hand, tiny little copies, the compiler can give you a piece of that. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, what we also found, like this, we, like, I, like, I can't thank the Cray compiler developers enough for all the time that they've spent helping us understand things. The one thing that I didn't understand was when we needed to synchronize things, it seemed like there wasn't a very intuitive construct to, to do this. So what we do in the code is, just to go back to this piece of code here, I need to perform a communication call for the X3 direction, and earlier I have queued a non, an asynchronous data movement to the host. I need to synchronize before I perform this communication call. So this is how we do it. We do OMP target depend in and target. It's an empty target task that doesn't do anything, but it does provide the synchronization we need. And from what I understand in the technical report five, maybe I, I'm not the OpenMP standards uh, person, but I do believe that something like this is to be supported. OMP task weight depend where we can put this with the sync variable that we would need for a given coordinate direction, we would definitely uh, appreciate that because I, I, to me this would be more intuitive than the current way of synchronizing with an empty kind of dummy target task. Another thing that we, that we, are, we are kind of still working with and trying to understand is that when we have asynchronous target tasks, like how do we get the timing information for these target tasks? Uh, to kind of contrast this, if I have an explicit task on the host that I put a depend clause on and, uh, or, or, or whatever, I, I can kind of put all the MPIW times and, and, and I can time the beginning of the task and the end of the task and, and, and really understand like when did the task start, when did the task complete and all that kind of information. But for the target task, I'm not really too sure how to do that other than using system software like MVProf uh, to get some of the kernel information. So because um, I, I believe like with the target t with the target task it has to and, and you have teams like there's not really much I can put in between the, the like the do loops like I, I I don't really know how to say get the start time and the end time for when this thing actually ran on the GPU and it would be uh, really helpful to us when we try to say produce timeline data like this for our GPU code if if the if the OpenMP target tasks were able to provide that information for us. Um, so anyway, I would just like to say that uh, OpenMP has been very useful to us. We enjoy it very much. Uh, and we've been using it in our turbulence simulation codes for quite some time. Uh, on, on Blue Waters, we, we, we have found that using dedicated communication threads, uh, at least at the level of locks, I, I want to continue to explore that, that task-based approach, was, was really improving scalability uh, more than anything we saw with the pure MPI approach. Uh, and, and then on Titan, you know, we, we have the uh, good acceleration of the, of the target task. Uh, the, the computational performance is, is very good, it seems. And we're also able to use the OpenMP 4.5 depend and no wait to actually do the overlap to improve scalability. Uh, the future work, we are trying to work on a, uh, on a manuscript to, to report these algorithms. And we, in the future, we have to tackle the whole pseudo-spectral code. Like, we can't, we can't ignore that forever. Uh, and then we're also working to port these kernels to Summit Dev, I, I should say, uh, using XLF. And we've had some great uh, uh, interactions so far with the IBM uh, compiler developers who have been very helpful uh, for us to understand what's, what's needed for that. Um, so anyway, uh, that's all.
the issue you want to get the target cast and then create this thing on the device and you want to synchronize it on the CPU with what's being done on the yeah. So the, the target tasks Yeah, so I think they have on Titan at least they support kind of like using the use device pointer and it's like, uh, I, I, I can't remember the technical term, but it's like MPI uses the device pointer to kind of figure out how to do the communication maybe a little bit more efficiently for you. Yeah, our code is not written to do that, but I mean we could try to, to do that in the future if the MPI implementation supported it. I believe my, my lab mate has done that some on Titan and some at Dev where his communication calls, like his alt alls, are they have a target like a use device pointer and then the, the MPI knows how to interpret that. But I'm not 100% sure. We, we, this code was not developed with that in mind. But it knows that the data it needs for the communication call is yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't think that we would, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. But um, for the third point, um, you probably want to look into the tools interface because in the tools interface we, we provide uh, um, timing information that you Oh, great, thank you. Yeah, so I didn't know that, but I'll take a look for sure. Thank you.